Hey everybody, so today we are going to lecture on gait training and it's just a basic overview with some normal gait, a few abnormal gait patterns, and key terms. Um, there are your objectives. You can find this lecture under the lessons folder in Blackboard and follow along um, there if you would like to. Here are our key terms. Um, much of this is in your mobility in context book if you want to refer back. So the first thing we want to talk about is their weight bearing status. So toe touch weight bearing is when the person is allowed to touch the toe to the ground, but not put any weight on that toe. So remember we talked about in class how um, sometimes the weight of the limb hanging itself, if it was NWB non weight bearing, NWB would be that abbreviation. If someone was non weight bearing status, then the weight of the limb itself causes a distraction force at the hip. And so oftentimes if it is a hip complication, that in itself um, could uh, be damaging to the surgical site or to the injury. And um, toe touch weight bearing can be with other ailments as well. But typically the reason that they have toe touch weight bearing is that they want the weight of the limb resting on the ground to decrease the distraction force throughout the limb, but they don't actually want any weight placed on the limb. Partial weight bearing typically comes with a specification from the medical doctor. So it may be a 10% partial weight bearing or a 30% partial weight bearing. If there is not a status set, if it just says partial weight bearing, then um, it's typically between 20 and 50% of the patient, patient's body weight that they're allowed to place on that extremity. Um, touch down weight bearing, somewhat of an older term. It's not used a lot anymore. Um, usually they use toe touch weight bearing, but it's essentially the uh, same type of concept that it's able to touch the ground, but not put any weight on it. Weight bearing as tolerated is when a patient is able to place as much the um, injury itself is in good enough shape that they can place weight on that limb but it's probably going to be painful so they put as much as they uh, can tolerate can bear based on pain levels and then full weight bearing fwb is back to normal status so they may not be able to fully walk without an antalgic gait pattern. They may still be limping or whatnot, but they are cleared to bear all of their weight on that limb just as they had before the injury. Um, cadence is just the number of steps taken in a given time. Um, step length is what we'd like to talk about next. So that is the distance between a point in the gait cycle and then the same point of the opposite side. So if we started with heel strike, heel strike is the moment where the heel touches the ground with the right leg, then a step length would be completed once the left leg touches the ground, heel strike on the left. Um, so that is your step length from the time one foot touches the ground to the time the other touches the ground. Um, it could be, you could judge it by other parts of the gait cycle, but it's the same part of the gait cycle for each leg. So if we were judging it based off toe off, or push off, then it would be from push off on the right until push off occurred on the left. That's one step length. Stride length is typically double the step length. So it is from the moment, if we're judging it from heel strike, it would be from the moment the heel struck the ground on the right, you would complete a step on the left, and once the right heel meets the ground again, that is a full stride length. The stride length goes through the entire gait cycle for one extremity. So you basically have taken two steps, a step on the right, a step on the left. Once the right comes back, you are completing a full stride. It, in a normal gait pattern, it should be about t double step length because it would be two steps. Um, and then velocity is the, the gait speed, how fast someone is ambulating. The components of normal gait. So First, we start with heel strike. Now, there are different um, terms used for these same components, but we'll get more into that in kinesiology too, so that we can um, really pinpoint what these different ones are called. So right now, 
we will just go um, off the terms I have listed and just understand that there are some other terms the same uh, phases go by. Okay, so heel strike is the moment that the heel touches the ground. Foot flat as you begin to progress forward and the full foot is in contact with the ground, that is full flat, foot flat. Mid stance is the point where the knee and the hip are in line over the foot. So that's uh, everything is kind of in line. Uh, the full weight is over top of the foot. Heel off is the moment that the heel comes off the ground as you're progressing forward. Toe off is the moment that um, you your toe finally leaves the ground and you then enter swing phase. So that entire time we were in stance phase. Any time that your foot is in contact with the ground, that's considered stance phase. Once it leaves the ground, that's swing phase. So that's from the moment toe off occurs to the moment another heel strike occurs. And there are some things going on during swing phase, but we will take a deeper look in that in kinesiology too. Um, so as of right now, I just need you to know heel strike, heel touches the ground. Foot flat, the foot is in full contact with the ground. The mid stance is basically everything is in a line. Heel off, the, the foot is beginning to come off the ground. The heel has removed itself from the ground, toe off, the whole foot is now leaving the ground. You have entered swing phase. Before that, we were in stance phase. Now we're in swing phase. We're just progressing the limb forward to take another step. And the moment it uh, hits the ground again, heel strike, you're now in a new gait cycle and you've completed a full stride. Um, so during swing, we have initial swing where the foot is just lifted off the ground, mid-swing, once the tibia is vertical, so straight up and down, this doesn't necessarily show mid-swing, it needs to be straight up and down, and then terminal swing um, is the last part from the point where the um, tibia is vertical until the foot touches the ground, so it's just the foot is progressing forward throughout terminal swing. We have... Um, quite a few. This is just a few of the abnormal gait patterns. There are more than this, but these are some of the primary ones you'll see most often. Um, so Trendelenburg, um, also known as myopathic gait, is typically caused by the, a weak gluteus medius, and it is when you take one leg off the ground, so during swing phase, the pelvis drops. So it would actually be if I'm standing on my left leg, when I take the right leg off the ground and I'm standing on my left leg, if my left gluteus medius is weak, my right hip will drop. And then if I'm standing on my right leg, if my right gluteus medius is strong, if it's not weak, then my pelvis will stay um, level and my hip will not drop. So that is Trendelenburg gait. Um, hemiplegic gait is essentially after a stroke, typically when somebody has one side of their body that is weak. Um, and uh, we'll go through the video there. Neuropathic gait, um, also steppage or equine gait. So it's like um, a horse, like a horse walking um, is essentially with weak dorsiflexors, um, so the foot kind of drops. So rather than keeping the foot in dorsiflexion, as you're progressing it forward, the foot will drop. And so they have to actually bring their leg up higher to keep the foot from um, dragging across on the ground. And um, that would be weak dorsiflexors. It could happen after a stroke. It could happen uh, with cerebral palsy or something like that, um, but it has several names. Steppage gait and Aquinas gait uh, is what I hear it referred to most often, but as the leg leaves the ground, the, you have to do a high knee, essentially, in order to clear the foot from the ground, because rather than the foot being in a dorsiflex position, it's hanging down into plantar flexion, and if you don't lift that side up higher, 
um, then it will drag the ground and cause you to trip. Uh, coriform or hyperkinetic gait is caused by a disorder of the basal ganglia and it is a very spastic jerky gait, uh, very jerky movements. Ataxic um, or a cella cerebellar gait. <laughs> um, they have a wide base of support. They're very clumsy, staggering, almost like they're falling forward with each step. Um, the hyperkinetic, um, another thing about that, going back to that, is um, increased movements. So random movements are present that wouldn't normally be there. With Parkinson, there's a Parkinsonian gait or a shuffling gait pattern that's normal with somebody who either has Parkinson's syndrome or Parkinsonian symptoms. And the shuffling gait is they just keep their feet on the ground and just shuffle them forward. So it's little tiny steps. Their feet typically don't even leave the ground and they are moving their feet quickly, but barely going anywhere, just barely shuffling along. Um, a sensory or a stomping gait is more seen in children with um, who are deemed as sensory seekers. Maybe they have um, autism spectrum disorder or some type of a um, sensory processing disorder. The, the stomping gait is where they are forcefully touching the ground with their feet in order to increase the impact that they get, the proprioception. Um, toe walking is just what it says. You're walking on the toes, keeping the heels from meeting the ground. Often, um, it is actually because of a sensory issue that the patient does not like uh, to the feel of the ground on their feet. And so they're trying to touch the ground with as little um, portion of their feet as possible. But over time, if you continue to walk like that, you'll get to a point where the heel cord, the Achilles tendon shortens so much that you're not able to even place the heel on the ground. That is your toe walking. Um, and then your Deshaies gait, Deshaies gait, um, is your Trendelenburg with a compensatory side link. So rather than just having the hip dropping, now they're also leaning to the uh, opposite side in order to um, clear the ground. So it could be a hip hike that they do. It could be a trunk lean to the opposite side. They may even circumduct their leg and pull it around. Um, but the Deshaines is particularly talking that they about them having a contralateral trunk lean. So if the right gluteus medius is weak, then when they're standing on the right, um, the left hip drops. So they end up leaning away from the hip that drops, but you could also call it an ipsilateral trunk lean because they're leaning towards the weak leg. <laughs> Their left side drops, but they lean towards the weak leg in order to allow that part of the hip of the pelvis to raise back up. So as, so if you're standing on your right leg and your right gluteus medius should be contracting to stabilize the pelvis, but it's not, so your pelvis is dropping, then you would lean to the same side of the weakness. You would lean towards the weakness, towards the right to balance out the pelvis again. Um, and let me know if any of that is confusing or if you have any questions about that, I, I would love to answer them however I can. All right, so muscle weakness and paralysis. Um, so we have listed on the left the common weak areas. And then um, on the right, some of the common abnormalities. So I'll just read out the common weak areas, your hip flexors, the abductors going away. Dorsiflexors is definitely, sometimes the plantar flexors will be weak, but typically dorsiflexors more so. You'll find foot drop, um, Hip extensors, so you notice that during push-off, pushing away from the ground. Your knee flexors or extensors could be weak, but if your extensors are weak, typically your knee will buckle. Your core stabilizers could be weak, which may cause some type of a, get, a trunk lean. And then your hip internal rotators um, are some of the common weak areas. Now, as far as the 
common gait abnormality, circumduction is where you're taking one leg and you're swinging it around. So rather than going forward by, um, by flexing the hip, so if you have weak hip flexors, this would be common, rather than flexing the hip and progressing the leg straight forward, you're swinging it around because the hip flexors are weak. That is a compensation. A forward trunk lean can be a compensation for several things. It could be for some core weakness. It could be actually due to back pain. That's often what I'll see is that they're kind of in a flex position because the extended position hurts. Um, and it could also be tight iliopsoas. Remember, it's connected at the low back and then connects to the front of the hip. So if it's tight, it pulls you into an anterior trunk lean. Um, and if it's which comes first, the chicken or the leg. If they're leaning forward, maybe due to pain or something, the iliopsoas will become tight. <laughs> and if they have an, a tight iliopsoas, it will cause them to lean forward. So those go hand in hand. Um, foot flat at heel strike basically means the dorsiflexors are just strong enough to keep the foot from dragging the ground. But the moment the heel strikes, the foot just falls to the ground because the dorsiflexors are weak. So it sounds like a clap. As soon as the heel touches the ground, the whole foot does. So it sounds like a clap. It's a heel or a foot flat at heel strike. And oftentimes you can hear it's an audible gait pattern. Um, knee flexion in terminal stance. TS is terminal stance. Um, and so in terminal stance, that's the very end of a swing phase or stance phase, I'm sorry, the very end of stance phase, and your knee should be uh, extended during that position. If the knee is flexed there, that would probably mean a tightness in the hamstrings. Oftentimes, I see it in children with cerebral palsy that they keep the knees flexed the whole time, and it's based on um, tone in their hamstrings. Uh, waddling gait is leaning side to side. You would see it really almost as a normal gait pattern in someone who's pregnant in their late stages of pregnancy because of the heavy load they're carrying and the change in their um, center of gravity and all that. So waddling gait could be with a pregnant woman just waddling side to side. Um, it could also be based on weaknesses. Um, over pronation. So remember pronation, your um, ankles, your feet are turning inward. Um, and so over pronation is basically um, the arch part of your foot is now flat in contact with the ground. They're turning inward and the arch is flat on the ground. Scissoring gait, as they're coming forward, rather than the feet staying somewhat apart, as in a normal gait pattern, the feet are coming either directly in front or crossing over the other leg. So one foot is crossing over the midline rather than walking forward like this every time. And it could just be one, like this would be my right leg just crossing over each time, but it could be both scissoring gait pattern. That often will happen with a neurological injury. It could also happen with weakness, significant weak abductors or tightness in the adductors causing them to go forward. Knee bu buckling, again, we said if your extensors, like your quads, are weak, oftentimes your knee will buckle. It happens with the hemiplegic gait as well. A step two gait pattern. So in a normal gait pattern, you step a leg forward, you step the next leg past it, and it keeps going every time you step past. Step two means you step one leg forward, the other one meets it. One leg forward, the other one meets it. That is a step two gait pattern. Oftentimes people do that because of pain. And so the, the painful leg, they want to stand on the least amount possible. So they will progress it forward normally. The painful leg, they'll move forward normally. But as soon as they start to put weight on it, it hurts. So they quickly put the other foot back on the ground. So it's actually um, the side that's moving forward the most is the painful leg because it's it has no problem moving forward. It's when you're standing on that leg, it's painful. So they quickly put the other leg to the ground. That is your step two gait. Your antalgic gait is also a painful gait pattern. It be, could be caused from pain anywhere along the chain, from hip pain, knee pain, ankle pain, anywhere along the ch chain, it would still be called antalgic. It's basically what a layperson would call a limp. So 
Um, if it is, depending on what part of the chain is painful, you could call it different gait patterns, but all of them would fall under the category of antalgic. So typically, if you're writing in your notes antalgic, you need to specify if you can. Sometimes you may not be able, if you're just doing it in real time, ideally you would record them walking so you could either slow it down or repeat it a few times and find out exactly what it looks like is painful or what area is uh, the problem area. But if you cannot, then you could just call it antalgic if that's what it is. Um, ideally, you would put antalgic gait, um, you know, related to hip pain or knee pain or, or whatever they're experiencing or what you notice and see. Towing out, so your feet should be pointing basically forward. Towing out is where the feet are pointing out to the side as you're walking. Rather than pointing forward, they're pointing out to the side. Towing in is the exact opposite. Most people would call that pigeon-toed, where the toes are pointing in. Um, and then knee slap could also be from weak uh, quads and essentially when you place weight on your leg immediately the knee slaps back so it could be from some weak quads and they are not slowing down or eccentrically allowing um, the contraction forget about the eccentric so but primarily forget about the knee slap what I had mentioned primarily <laughs> sorry about that Primarily, the knee slap will occur if your foot is uh, stuck in plantar flexion. Um, that's when we see it the most. So if this is dorsiflexion, here's plantar flexion. As soon as you go to touch the ground, then your um, whole foot comes down and it slaps your knee back into extension. There could be some weakness at the knee that also allows that to happen, but oftentimes it's actually coming from... Um, weak dorsiflexors or even tone in the plantar flexors that are causing you to hit the ground rather than in a heel strike you're hitting it with your toes in plantar flexion and your um, whole foot is hitting the ground which is causing your knee to immediately go into extension and we can go over these in lab um, on Wednesday so that we can um, demonstrate those and you guys can get an idea of what it feels like, what it looks like, and go through that. So, gait training. There's a plethora of things that we can do to, um, to help someone walk better. Um, and all of that would be under the category of gait training. So, as you're progressing, you would go from even surfaces to uneven surface. That's a progression. You would go from maybe a slow speed to an increased speed. And gait speed has been called another one of the um, vital signs, a significant vital sign. And it actually, they've linked um, life expectancy with gait speed in a lot of the research. That if someone is able to walk with kind of a normalized gait speed um, for their age, then their life expectancy would be higher or longer than someone who has a very slow gait speed. And uh, one of the reasons being, then they're at a high fall risk. And we all know that if you fall, you start the decline. You know, you start, you get hospitalized, you may have to have a surgery, you may get pneumonia. Um, oftentimes, a fall is what starts the decline that causes someone to end up going to assisted living or, um, you know, really having an overall negative change with their health and and the problem with that is a lot of people know that and so when they get to a certain age or once they start to see friends or family members fall then they get scared and so they change their gait pattern and actually walk slower which puts them at a higher risk of falling but they're trying to protect themselves so fear of falling is a huge um, negative thing in people because they change their gait pattern for worse. Also, they start to shuffle their legs. They're not picking them up, which also makes them more likely to fall. Um, <clears throat> so another progression is if they're walking with just their normal stride length. And when I say normal here, it really is a shortened stride length. Like maybe they're not taking a very big step. Then you would try to get them to take bigger steps. Um, that's one of the things I'll do 
with my uh, vestibular patients is have them take as large of a step as possible. You could even put duct tape or some type of visual um, on the floor for them to step over. Make sure each time you're stepping over the tape. You can put objects, but the problem is if they're already at fall risk and they're not at that point yet where they're able to actually step over the object, then it may um, cause them to fall. You know, you are there to catch, but um, so you don't want to risk that if it's kind of the beginning of treatment. They could progress to that and step over objects. Um, over time, you want to increase their distance that they walk. Um, some of the things we do are monster walks, sidestepping skaters. So all of these um, with monsters walk, walks, your legs are far apart. You're kind of in a little mini squat. You know, you, your knees are slightly bent and you're walking forward. Um, you can also do it with straight legs, but almost like a Frankenstein walk. You keep the legs wide and you're walking forward. And it's good actually strengthening for your gluteus medius. Um, side stepping is also good for gluteus medius and for your abductors. Skaters is basically at an angle. So rather than straight to the side or straight forward, you're kind of at a 45 degree angle, like you're skating side to side. Um, and with any of those, you can also add a TheraBand tied around their knee to give extra resistance. Tandem walking is when you're walking one foot in front of the other, like a drunk test, um, like your sobriety test. If you get pulled over, you're walking on like a line. That is called tandem walking. You could put a line on the ground um, and like a duct tape line or something, have them walk on that. Some uh, clinics will have balance beams, but I do think that's a progression. I would still start with a line on the ground or just tandem walking on the ground before they did a balance beam because if they start to get unsteady on the ground, they can easily just step further apart. If they start to get unsteady on the balance beam, they're starting to fall and you're going to have to catch them. Um, and then walking around or over objects. I skipped over that one. Sorry. I kind of mentioned it earlier, um, but oftentimes I will put cones on the ground and they'll walk around the cones kind of swerving in and out like a figure eight they'll step over the cones they even can turn to the side and do side stepping over the cones um, all of those are things that they can do to progress their gait training uh, multitasking so remember we talked about in class dual tasking so where you're doing two things at once People with balance deficits have a really hard time dual tasking. So while they're walking, oftentimes they will have to completely stop in order to answer a question. So that's talking while walking. That's dual tasking. And, you know, if they have are having trouble talking while walking because they're so out of breath, well, that's completely different. But if it's not because they're out of breath, they just have to stop in order to answer the question, then they're having trouble processing both things in order to do both tasks. So practicing that is good. You could also have them carry a glass of water or a tray. You could have them, um, you know, pull some putty apart or pinch closed pins. Anything that's causing them to um, think of two different things rather than just focusing on the walking um, to be able to think of another thing. I, I like to carry, uh, have them carry a tray with a, you know, fake plate or something on it. You don't want anything that would shatter because <laughs> they may drop it, but uh, because that's a very functional activity, going to a restaurant, grabbing your plate, and taking it back to your table. Um, but it's very difficult for someone who has to really put a lot of focus and emphasis on their actual gait pattern. Swerving around cones, we talked about that one. Walking between two converging lines. So converging lines, you have two lines on the floor, and they are going towards each other. They may meet like a V, or they may just go get more and more narrow. Um, this is really difficult to do for someone with Parkinson's disease or Parkinsonian syndrome um, or um, symptoms because um, it often triggers that freezing of gait. Freezing of gait is when they're walking and then their legs kind of stop moving. Um, seeing the lines converge for whatever reason triggers something in their brain as if they're coming to like a corner or a stopping place. And so their brain starts to send out this inhibitory signal to say stop, and it's hard for them to override that. So walking 
between converging lines is a good way to practice them overriding that inhibitory signal that their brain is constantly sending out with Parkinson's disease. Um, marching, just getting your knees up high. You could do it in place or while you're walking. Um, grapevine is, of course, where you have one leg goes behind and then it goes in front and you step to the side. So you step to the side, leg goes behind, step to the side, leg goes in front. Well, we, we do that what, with the electric slide or with the grapevine. <laughs> Some of you are way younger than that generation, but the grapevine still exists today. You have uh, karaoke is what um, some people call it. And you have one leg, you step it to the side, you can bring the leg in front, step to the side, bring it behind, and you alternate that over and over. And then you don't have them turn around, but you have them do the same thing back to the opposite side. So they step and go forward, step and go back, step forward, step back. Picking up objects, oftentimes I'll do that with the cones. I'll have them walk around the cones, step over the cones, and then pick up the cones and hand them to me. Because it's a high enough object that you typically don't have as much loss of balance with that. And then you could pro progress to lower cones or to lower objects on the ground. Um, a lot of people lose their balance when they are picking objects up off the floor. And it's a very functional task. How often do you pick up a shoe or a child's toy or... Um, anything that's fallen on the ground, even their assistive device, if they drop the cane on the ground, they may have to pick it up in order to be steady again. So that's a great thing to practice in the um, clinic. Retroambulation, of course, is referring to walking backwards. Um, that's a great way to eccentric, eccentrically strengthen the muscles that re are required to walk forward. And remember, um, eccentric, <laughs> eccentric strengthening is a great way to strengthen your muscles. Um, figure eights, we talked about starts and stops. Again, with Parkinson's disease, and this is also um, hard for people with balance problems in general, uh, anybody with balance deficits, but it's specifically with Parkinson's disease, they have trouble initiating movement. So once they stop, it's really hard to start again. So practicing that so that they learn how to override that signal. Um, and oftentimes with sudden stops, people will start to fall forward. So make sure you're ready to catch. You have that gate belt on and you're in place to catch the person, but also um, still practice that as, as you're able um, to get them to be used to doing that. It's something we have to do functionally in, in the community. Weight shifts, they can stand and shift side to side, or they can uh, stagger their legs and shift forward and backwards. And then quick turns, um, sometimes I'll play somewhat of a gr red light, green light type game um, with stops and starts or even with quick turns. I'll say, okay, walk forward. And as soon as I say turn, you need to turn and start walking in the opposite direction. And so we'll just keep doing that. Now turn and they have to walk in the opposite direction, turn back in the opposite direction. And um, the turns themselves often will cause people to lose their balance and then continuing to walk once they have turned uh, often they'll misstep and start kind of staggering to the side so it's a great thing to practice with your uh, fall risk patients indications for gait training if their gait is abnormal any of the ones we spoke about or or something different if there are weaknesses if they are at a fall risk that's a huge indication that they need uh, gait training, fall risk or recent falls. Um, if they have low endurance, you can use it also to increase their endurance and their ability to walk. Some of our goals might say be able to walk 150 feet for normal household ambulation or greater than 250 feet for community ambulation. There's certain distances that have been noted that are required you know even if you're able to go to walmart and ride in the cart in order to grocery shop you have to actually be able to walk from your parking space into the store in order to get that scooter um, if you don't have power mobility of your own or a wheelchair or something so there's been distances that have been determined to be a safe community distance that someone to be a community ambulator they need to walk be able to walk at least 250 feet that is the distance for that. And then 150 feet is typically for your household ambulation to be, to be able to safely walk from your bedroom to the bathroom or the kitchen or whatnot. 
Um, so oftentimes our gate goals will be based on those um, standard distances. Um, but it could also be based on others, like their prior level of function, um, something like that. And then balance deficits um, would indicate that they need some gait training or any type of recent change in their status. They had a surgery, now they need to learn to walk with this assistive device or with this brace on or with this weight-bearing restriction. Um, all of those would be indications for you to teach them um, and walk with them with the gait training. Now, gait training is not <laughs> just going for a walk. That is not skilled. If you're just walking around and you're like, oh, you made it 10 minutes today. Let's try for 11 tomorrow. That is not gait training. While you're walking, the skilled part is you are cueing them on ways to walk with a more normalized gait pattern. Lift your leg up. Take a larger step. Stand straighter. Um, you know, all the, whatever you notice, if they're leaning forward, then your key would be to straighten out the trunk, to stand up straighter. All of those things, um, would go into more of a skilled treatment to be considered gait training. If all you're doing is walking and holding onto their gait belt, um, you know, anybody could do that. So make sure it is a skill. All right. So preparing for gait training. So these we call pre-gait activities, um, pre-gait activities. So things that we will do oftentimes to get them to a place where they're able to start gait training. Um, you may do it just as an assessment to see, okay, let's see how they do just placing weight on the leg before we start walking down the hall. Um, but oftentimes we do it actually as an exercise to get them strong enough to be able to handle gait training. So standing balance, any type of standing balance, you may alter their base of support, stagger their stance, widen the base, narrow the base to get them prepared for walking. Weight shifts, again, side to side or forward and backward. The cha-cha, so um, uh, I was trying to, I was going to think of the song that says it, but it's the cha-cha slide. So there we go, cha-cha. Um, <laughs> taking the foot forward and back. So one foot is basically on the ground. The other foot goes forward and touches the ground and back and touches the ground and forward and touches the ground and back and touches the ground. That is the cha-cha. And then you could trade legs and do it on the other. And that's a great pre-gate activity. Um, any type of strengthening to strengthen whatever muscles are weak that you've noticed are changing their gait cycle could be considered a pre-gate activity. We typically call them therex but it would still be appropriate for doing in order to prepare for gait training. Proper placement and adjustment of assisted device, that is key. Now, once you've done it once, I mean, just kind of look each time to make sure it hasn't changed. I don't know how many times I have went in to somebody's home. Their assisted device was completely set up wrong. You know, maybe it was borrowed from a family member and it was not for them at all. I'll fix it, and the next time I come, somebody's fixed it back where it was before. <laughs> so do check, but most of the time, um, you can set it up appropriately, and especially if somebody um, is very cognitively with it and um, not relying on caregivers or anything for their uh, support, then oftentimes once you fix it once, then you may just continue to educate them on proper use of it, but always check and make sure it's adjusted appropriately, especially like with crutches. One thing that I notice oftentimes is the hand, um, the uh, hand support on the crutch is too low. I cannot tell you the number of times that I have had to move that up because what they're doing is they're placing weight on their armpit, which of course we we learned could cause a peripheral nerve injury or impingement there. And um, the reason they have to do that is because they had to raise the crutch up so high in order to even reach the hand grasp. Um, and so what I'll do is I will raise the um, hand grasp in the crutch and then lower the crutch to its normal height. Uh, we went uh, two or three fingers in between the crutch and the armpit and then they're able to use it appropriately. Gate belt placement, the gate belt needs to be low around the hips. If it is up under the armpits, 
that is not right. <laughs> and if you have somebody that you've put it on low and it keeps scooting up, scooting up, then you need to move it back down and tighten it. Um, but it needs to be low on the hips. There are some exceptions to the rule. Always there are exceptions to the rule. If somebody has a colostomy bag or they have some type of an open womb or some type of something that keeps you from being able to safely place the gate belt in the standard position, you may have to have it up higher. But I will tell you, I don't know how many times in a skilled nursing facility I come in to, uh, or, you know, I have seen where you go into the patient and uh, their gate belt is up under their armpits. And I don't know if it migrated there or if it was placed there intentionally, but ideally it needs to be down low at the level of the hip. Okay, so basically where you would wear a normal belt, unless you wear your pants really high, um, but down near the ASIS, down low, to be able to stabilize them and have um, them at the appropriate um, place for their center of gravity. Prepare the environment, especially in the acute care setting, when they're hooked to IVs or ports or blood pressure cuffs or whatever. So anything that you can safely um, disconnect, like, okay, we're walking down the hall. I don't need your blood pressure taken. Let's just go ahead and take that off. Um, anything you can safely disconnect, even sometimes the IV. Sometimes they can um, adjust the IV so it stops dripping and disconnect it while you walk down the hall. Anything you can safely disconnect, do. Because the more lines and things you have to drag with you, the harder it is to maneuver. Um, oftentimes what we'll do is we'll have, we'll have an IV pole, we have a oxygen cannula, <laughs> an oxygen tank that we're dragging behind, we have a wheelchair we're dragging behind, so that can become very hard to help um, guard the patient appropriately if your hands are full of other equipment. How are you holding on to the gate belt? So sometimes what we'll do is either grab a second pair of hands, grab a rehab tech or someone to help with the line. So if that's the case, then the therapist, the more trained individual, needs to be guarding the patient and the rehab tech, or uh, even if it's a caregiver that's wanting to help or something, would just be uh, dragging along the wheelchair or the oxygen tank. But you would focus on the patient, okay? You don't go and focus on the lines and allow or um, trust <laughs> the patient's stability in the hands of their caregiver or rehab tech or whoever. You focus on you're guarding the patient and they can move the other. Now, if you don't have a second pair of hands, what you can do is sometimes what they'll do is they'll stack things into the wheelchair. They might place the oxygen tank into the wheelchair or they might connect somehow the wheelchair with the IV pole so that you're just dragging along the wheelchair with one hand behind you and holding the patient with the other so that you can safely do it all. Um, but that takes some experience to get used to that. And um, so if you are in that setting, I would certainly, uh, ideally it would be for a clinical placement and you would be learning under somebody who knows how to maneuver around those. But prepare the environment. Get the wheelchair on the right side of the bed, the correct, not the right, but the correct side of the bed so that when they're getting up, there's a wheelchair there. Same with the assisted device. Get it in within reach so that you can pull it close as soon as they stand up. Uh, make sure all the leads or all the IVs, anything they're connected to, are on the side of the bed that you plan to get them up. Have the bed rails down. Have the bed in a good position for standing. So rather than having it at its lowest position, maybe a little bit higher or something. Um, you don't want it real high. You want them to be able to touch the ground when you have them sit up. But prepare that environment. Um, in a patient who didn't walk into treatment, so maybe at a skilled nursing facility or inpatient where you come in and they're laying in a bed, assess a few steps before leaving the room. You could have them walk around their bed, walk from the bed to a chair, something like that before you leave the room. And that way you don't get into a situation where you're in the middle of the hallway, there's nowhere to sit, and they're starting to go down on you. <laughs> they're starting to fall down on you. They're starting to lose their balance is what I'm saying. And, <laughs> and um, you don't want to be in that situation. Uh, you would much rather take a few steps in the room and realize, okay, they're super unsteady. I'm not safe to go in the hallway with them before you get a few steps into the hallway and you have nowhere to go with them. 
Um, I'm sure the vitals are appropriate for the um, acute patient. You know, if they, you have to check their chart and make sure it's safe for them to get up, check their vitals to make sure they're within, um, in home health, this is really key to that they're within the parameters that have been set for them. If their blood pressure is too high or their oxygen sat is too low, you are not allowed to walk them. So you have to make sure that they're cleared for that by doing a good chart review and checking their vitals before you start ambulating. Now in the outpatient setting, it may be a little different. It's a healthy individual. They walk themselves in and uh, they've had a knee surgery or something and you know that they are cleared for walking, you just want to make sure they know how to use their devices and all that. Always check the weight bearing status. The last thing you want to do is get somebody up out of the bed and then uh, realize that they were supposed to be non-weight bearing and now they're standing there with weight on both of their legs. Definitely check that before. Okay. Proper guarding. Um, I stand slightly behind and towards their weak side. Um, you may need to stand towards the stronger side. You know, every individual, it's a little different if it, based on their scenario, if they have, you know, poles and things that are connected to one side. But in the best case scenario, I would stand slightly behind and towards their weaker side. What I like to do is stand behind and I have one hand low on the gate belt and one hand right in front of the weaker side in front of the shoulder. So that if they go forward, I have a hand to catch. If they go backwards, I have a gate belt to stabilize. And I'm also behind them, so I have my body that I can push into them if they fall backwards. Or I can lean back and use my body weight to pull them backwards if they start to fall forward. We'll practice this in lab. Um, make sure you remind me and we will practice where the gate belt goes, how you hold it, how you stabilize them if they begin to fall, where your, what your placement is. But I do like my own basis support to be a little bit wide, my knees to be a little bit bent, so if they start to go, I don't go with them. <laughs> you got to be stable yourself in order to help them stabilize. Um, but try not to interfere with their gait patterns. Sometimes if you're standing directly behind them, I see a lot of people teach it that way to stand directly behind. But if you are, you have to really widen your base of support and waddle behind them. And it's not always the most ideal position for you or for stability. Um, so I would recommend rather than being directly behind, being to the side like um, this group is, how they are. This is exactly where I would stand. I would be her. I would have the gate belt, the arm behind holding a gate belt, and this arm right in front of the shoulder. Um, I say her because I almost always stand on the left. <laughs> I'm much more comfortable holding the gate belt with the right hand and put my left hand in front. Um, and if I t switch and go to the other side, I sometimes struggle. But but that is how I guard with one hand in front of the shoulder. Um all right, so maintain a grip on the gate belt. We talked about that. Place the gate belt low on their hip girdle. Tighten so that your fingers can barely slide in. If you can get a whole fist in between the gate belt and the patient, it is too loose. You need to be have trouble even fitting your fingers in. It needs to be a snug fit. Um, you supinate, so you grab up under the gate belt. If you grab down and they start to fall, it will just go down. <laughs> so if you go down into the gate belt and then the patient starts to fall, their gate belt will just fall down from your hand. So you grab under the gate belt with your hand supinated and put your hand up in it. Um, your free hand is near the patient available to help as well. And again, I put it in front of the shoulder. All right. So proper assistive device. Um, there's a page there for you to refer to in your book. Um, that offer some helpful questions. Um, all right, so you determine what assistive device they need based on their physical abilities or their needs, based on the activities that it will be used for if they're just walking on flat ground versus going up and down stairs. Um, how much activity are they walking short distances or are they going back to high school and they're walking all throughout their or college, you know, throughout the whole campus? Um, the patient's perception 
and likelihood of compliance. So oftentimes you see younger people with crutches. That's socially accepted to see a young person with crutches. You see athletes with crutches. You know, most people don't have negative stigmas. But if you try and give a high schooler a walker, then they may picture that as being a something that only an older person would use. And so they may not want to use it and be less compliant because they're embarrassed of that assistive device. When I had my um, hip surgery in college, I chose a walker because it's more stable and I felt more safe carrying the walker. And you can also take your hands off and do stuff um, without it falling down like crutches would. Um, but even then, even though I was in PT school and knew that it wasn't just for the elderly population, I still had a little bit of a, you know, I felt a little embarrassed sometimes going out places on my walker, you know, being 21 years old or whatnot. So, um, I might've been like 23, but still, <laughs> all right. Um, for each patient, you need to determine the amount of support they need. Again, the walker is more stable. The crutches provide a little bit more mobility and fast mobility and ability maybe to go up and down stairs a little more readily. Um, the amount of stability required, um, the amount of energy expenditure possible, crutches will make you uh, expend more energy versus the walker, you know, you have to move it forward, but you don't have to kind of bounce and uh, do the other patterns with that. So there's a chart on page 420 that you can refer to with some helpful guides on how to choose the assistive device. I will say for a physical therapist assistant, Typically, often the medical doctor will set them up with a, the assistive device. Almost always, though, <laughs> when they come in with the assistive device, I typically don't change which assistive device the medical doctor chose because, for one, insurance probably won't pay for another one if they did pay for that one. If the patient paid for that one, they'll just be out extra money if I change it. Um, so I typically don't change which assistive device, but I almost always have to set it up better. I have to readjust it to the proper height, almost always, especially with crutches, the, the hand grasp on the crutches. Um, but if they come to the clinic and don't have an assistive device, typically it's going to be the physical therapist during the initial eval that will recommend which type of assistive device and really in a perfect world would set it up for them. What may happen is that the they come, they don't have one, the PT recommends it, and then they come to the next treatment, they're on your schedule, and they have it with them, but it's not been set up for them. So you may have to adjust the assistive device. Um, you may even recommend assistive device. Maybe the PT didn't really feel like they needed one, but now all of a sudden they're more unstable than they were before. You may want to recommend. Even in that scenario, though, I would talk to the supervising PT. So if you feel like they need an assistive device or a different assistive device, I would always run it by the supervising PT out of respect for one um, and just to make sure that everybody's on the same page. You don't want to recommend one thing and then the PT goes and says, no, that's not appropriate. You know, you don't want that battle. It decreases the patient's confidence in both of you really. Um, and But you do need to understand how to set up the assisted devices. All right, so pros and cons to the assistive device. Um, I left this kind of open for discussion in prior classes, but the parallel bars, um, the pro is that it's very stable. Um, and uh, often people who are significantly impacted will take their first steps in a parallel bar. The con is it's not mobile at all. <laughs> it's stuck in one place. They don't have it in their home. They don't have it for functional use. It's just really to get them comfortable taking a step or two. So it is the most stable, uh, but it does provide no mobility whatsoever. Um, and then the walker um, is also stable. It The pros, it allows you to be able to walk and then release your hand without it falling over. Um, often the walkers will have uh, little pouches that you can connect, that you can put things in. Of course, some of the fancy ones, what we call, um, it's the real name is a rollator, um, but often people will call it their Cadillac. <laughs> Most of my patients would call it something like that, their Cadillac. Um, 
and it is the walker with the four wheels with a seat. You've seen those um, so that you can walk and then if you get tired, you can turn around and sit on it. The problem with that, if the seat flips up and you're able to walk inside the walker, well, that's great. You're still just as stable. Um, one problem is oftentimes people just wear those brakes out. They feel like it's going to slide, so they just hold the brake the whole time, and eventually the brake doesn't really work. But the other problem is if the seat does not fold up, if it stays down, what they have to do is actually walk behind the walker with it in front of them, which causes them to do an anterior trunk lean, which is often what they're already doing that's negative. That's already their gait abnormality and it's making it worse. They have to do an anterior trunk lean in order to reach the handles because they have to stand behind that seat. It makes it less stable and it makes them more likely to fall because then they're already leaned forward and if they start to go forward, they're not in the center of the assisted device. So there are um, some pros to the rollator. It does have some space sometimes for you to store things. You know, maybe a woman put her purse in it or whatnot. But if it causes them to walk further behind them and do more of an anterior trunk lean, I don't recommend it. However, I will say most of the patients that have those love them and will not change, even if you say they need a um, standard walker or something. Um, as far as the standard walker, one of the cons is the stigma. You know, if it's a younger person, they may not want to use it. Um, it is kind of large, but it does typically fold up and store pretty easily with the more the rollator. That's a little bit. You need a little more, bit more room in your vehicle or um, wherever you are to store it. Um, sometimes, especially with the rollator, at certain places like the movie theater or church or something where it's kind of like row seating, it's hard to do lateral movements. You know, when you go into a movie theater, decide where you sit or between pews at a church, and you're, you have to kind of scoot to the side to get to your seat, that's very difficult, especially it may not even fit between, but um, if it does, it doesn't have a ability to go sideways like that. So that might be a con for a walker. With auxiliary crutches, this is kind of what we picture as a standard crutch that an athlete or someone would use. Um, it is a little bit less stable um, than a walker. And one of the... Um, cons for the auxiliary crutches, the forearm crutches, and the cane would be for all of those, if you let go of it, it falls. Well, unless it's a quad cane, if it's just a straight point cane. Um, and that's not always best because once a assisted device is on the ground, then they have to do a maneuver that would already make them more likely to fall, picking something up off the ground without an assistive device. So you really don't want that in somebody who's significantly unstable. If it's somebody who's in great shape and they don't have balance deficits, they just had a knee uh, surgery or uh, injury or something, then you're probably not as worried about that. It typically will give you a little bit uh, faster mobility and more um, independence and, and ease of use during like stair mobility or an uneven surfaces so you kind of have more options of where you can and can't go and how easy it is to get in and out of places you can also use them in different ways if you're going sideways or walking you know in between seats um, they are smaller typically they uh, can fit in places a little bit easier um, you can teach them how to use them standing up and and different things like that um, and the auxiliary crutches and the forearm crutches are about the same pros and cons. Typically, I see forearm crutches used more for long-term use, somebody with cerebral palsy or spina bifida or something who's going to be using them their whole life. And auxiliary crutches are typically more short-term use. Um, but I don't know if that's because of expense um, or why. I couldn't tell you why. Um, Hemi walker is what's pictured up here uh, where it is a walker used on one side. Uh, oftentimes they will recommend this for someone that has had um, a stroke, something like that, where they have like weakness on one side and they just can't hold a walker on that side, but they still need a significant amount of stability. One good thing about that and the quad cane is if you let go of it, it's still standing on its own which you really want with that population. And um, the other things are um, 
it is stable it is mobile it folds up to a small size um, but it in itself has kind of a wide base which gives more stability but may limit you know your movement some um, you have to really kind of maneuver it around between doorways and things like that it can't just stay right beside of you um, and then a cane there are straight point canes which are a little bit less stable more likely to fall but um, kind of more user-friendly. <laughs> um, there are quad canes, which are bigger and bulkier, heavier, but they're more stable and less likely to fall. I will say that I have had a lot of older men who are willing to use a walking stick, like a um, wooden cane that does not adjust, but refuse to use any other assistive device. They may even use two walking sticks. They're fine with a walking stick, but they're not okay with any other assistive device because they're not an old person. You know, they, they like are very adamant that I'm not old enough to need that or I'm not, you know, they don't want the stigma. And so I've found many um, older men specifically who refuse to use any other assistive device. So it might be that they're, they're willing to use a cane and nothing else. There are canes that fold up and fit in a woman's purse or whatever. Um, again, you have to look at stability and, and which one they're likely to use. Um, I will say my grandmother had um, a hip surgery, and she was uh, developing Alzheimer's at this point, so her mom wasn't fully there, but <laughs> she, after that surgery, she walked with a quad cane the rest of her life, but she didn't actually walk with it. She didn't place it on the ground. It hung on her um, forearm like it was a purse or something, and she just walked along with it hanging on her forearm. And we would always try and get her to walk without it. And she would say, no, if somebody tries to mess with me, I'm going to hit them. It was just a weapon to her. <laughs> so she, for a long time, well, her, the rest of her life, uh, did that. But you don't want them just to keep it as a weapon. <laughs> All right. So here are your parallel bars. And this is going through what I just went through um, throughout the slide. So I should have went through... Um, but that's okay. Um, so we talked about this. One thing that I want to uh, talk about as far as parallel bars, you can adjust them to the patient's height. You can go further in, further out. The ones we have uh, in our clinic are super old, so uh, or in our lab. Now, this is a homemade one with PVC pipe. Probably not as adjustable, but it is stable. Um, the main thing I want to talk about is guarding the patient within. Um, some people will stand on the outside. It is super hard to guard a patient from the outside of the parallel bars because if they start to lose their balance, you have to reach over something to get them. So you're really limiting yourself. I always recommend to be inside of the parallel bars with them, ideally behind the patient. However, if you can, you push them up to the parallel bars in a wheelchair and then they, you stand them up, well, now you're behind a wheelchair behind them. And so it's sometimes hard to get in position. Sometimes you might need two people or somebody to come move the wheelchair so you can hurry and get behind them. Um, uh, the other thing is then if they, let's say they walk to one end and then they turn around and start walking back, it's hard to figure out how to maneuver around within the parallel bars, especially if it's a, if it's a larger person, in order to get behind them again because now you're in front of them. So it may be if they're stable enough that you start out behind them and then when they turn around now you're suddenly in front of them. It may be I have done if they are stable enough that I can leave them for, you know, half a second. What I will do sometimes is duck myself under the pillow bars and then jump behind them. <laughs> so I stay behind them till they get to the very end. I help them turn and then I duck under and go behind them. Um, I wouldn't say that's the best case scenario, but sometimes you just have to do what you have to do. So um, in an ideal world, you would be behind them, but definitely I want you within the parallel bars because if you're outside of the parallel bars and trying to guard, that is so difficult. The time I would say to do that is maybe if there's two therapists guarding, like one is helping progress the leg forward, one is helping uh, stabilize the patient, then maybe one could be in, one could be out. But if you're the only one with them, uh, I don't recommend guarding them outside of the parallel bar. Okay. Stair training. Um, so you want the patient to go down with the bad leg and up with the good. So as you go up, think about you put your leg on the stair and then you have to use that leg to 
pull up the rest the other leg but when you're going down you keep the the good leg up higher because it has to lower you slowly down to the next stair we'll practice this in lab um, but the saying to help you under or remember it is down with the bad and up with the good so as the patient is going up the stairs they put the good leg up first the stronger leg so that it can push um, up the other leg so it can push up to stand on the leg while the other leg progresses forward as they're coming down they go ahead and lower the weaker leg so that as they're lowering it the leg that's still on this step the good leg can slowly bend and allow them to lower that we'll practice that in lab so you can feel what it feels like and you'll i think you'll understand then why we do down with the bad up with the good um, you always stand below the patient. Now, this is something that Dr. Feltner and I have differed on in the past. The book does say to stand below the patient. It does say that there are certain scenarios that are exceptions to that rule, but um, as a general rule, stand below the patient. So as you see in this picture, she's now in front of the patient, but she's below. If they start to fall in this position, you can push their hip ba hips back and have them sit on the higher stair. Um, then when they're going up, you're below the patient. Um, and if they start to fall backwards, you can catch them. If they start to fall forward, then there's stairs in front of them. Of course, you can catch them if you can, but there's stairs in front of them to fall on. Now, if you are going down the stairs and you are behind the patient, some people will do that. I do not, and the book does not say that that is the best way. But if, they, if you are behind them and they're coming down the stairs and they start to fall, you're going with them. There's not really anything you can do unless maybe you're really big and they're really small and you can just use your brute strength. There's no way you can catch them versus if you're in front of them, they can fall onto you and you can stabilize them or you can push them backwards. So you are always below the patient. If they lose the balance, uh, you push their hip backwards to sit down. Um Oftentimes, we'll be at the bottom of the stair and we'll kind of start by just tapping their legs on the stair or by stepping up on the bottom stair and back down before we go all the way up. If I'm not sure that if we're safe to go up and down, then I'm just going to stay on one, two stairs at the most so that if they do fall, they're right there at the bottom anyways. Um, we don't want to risk it for sure. Um, you can also start with just a really small stair. They step up and down off a two inch stair and then you or it's usually called a box, um, and then you go up and up until it's more of a normalized stair before you actually start stair training. So um, going up and down on various size boxes, usually you start with two inch and progress to six or seven, and eventually nine. Um, nine is a standard curb, um, so that's why sometimes you'll try and get, that'll be kind of the end goal, so they can step on and off a curb. Uh, you may need to use handrails. You may need to just do one single handrail if they're too far apart. And a cane or the walker on the other side, we'll, we can practice this stuff in um, lab. I have seen people just sit and bump up or down the stairs um, in younger <laughs> people. Um, you know, that might be the preferred method. I wouldn't suggest it um, in, you know, grown or an elderly population, but if that's what they're most comfortable, I have had patients say, uh, I don't need to practice this. I just sit and bump up or bump down. <laughs> so if that's what they want to do, then they can. Um, bed mobility. Um, basically what I'm referring to here is just how to help a patient with weight bearing precautions maintain those precautions moving in bed. Because if they have a, let's say non weight bearing or toe touch weight bearing, they cannot bridge up in bed. They cannot place weight on that leg even in bed. So you still do need to practice how to move appropriately in the bed without placing weight on that um, limb. You also need to practice getting in and out of the bed with the assistive device. They need to have it nearby. What oftentimes people will do that have a walker is pull on it and pull it back on themselves and fall back down as they're trying to get up. So you need to practice that and teach them how to use it Usually you want them to have one hand behind them pushing up on the table and the other on the assistive device when they stand up um, and go from there. But I would not recommend them pulling up on any assistive device. Um, 
adjusting the bed height if it's possible, um, teaching them how to log roll, how to go from supine to sit, how to scoot in bed. All of these things are things you can practice uh, to get persons, uh, someone more independent with their bed mobility. Transfers. Um, so how to stand with various assistive device, how to move from the bed to the wheelchair without putting weight on the foot, how to um, how a caregiver can help them keep them from putting weight on the foot. One way to decrease um, the amount of weight they put on the foot is to straighten that leg up before they stand up. So if you're standing up and both legs are bent, most likely you're putting weight on both legs. But if you straighten one leg completely out, especially if you just hold it off the ground in that straight position, then you can't really weight bear on that leg. So that's often how we will teach them to stand from a seated position if they have a weight bearing precaution. Um, uh, yeah, don't hold on to your walker. Head and hips relationship. I always call it ratio, but it's, it's really the head um, hips relationship wherever um, your head is in relation to your hip is where your weight is. So you want them in opposite directions if you're trying to de-weight. So if you're trying to stand up, you need to lean forward to take the weight off the hips before you stand up. If you're trying to scoot to the right, you may actually lean to the left in order to take the weight off the right hip before you do like a sliding board transfer to the right. Um, wherever your head is, that's where your weight follows. So if you want to take weight off of your hips, you lean your head away from that area. If you want to de-weight the left hip, you lean to the right. Uh, if you want to de-weight the back part of the hips, you lean forward. That's the head hips relationship. Um, getting the environment set up, have the walker close, the wheelchair close, your gait belt on. You typically will go ahead and put the gait belt on in a seated position and then make sure that you readjust it to a tighter fit once they stand. Um, any other equipment you need, just having it nearby. And then how to retrieve an assisted device if they fall. That is kind of more of an advanced movement, but it's something you definitely need to show them in therapy. Even if maybe you're not ready to practice it yet, you could show them doing it yourself. They're just sitting and watching. You could teach the caregiver. Um, if a caregiver's there, of course, then they'll just get it for them. <laughs> that would be ideal. But eventually, if they get to a stable enough place that they could practice it themselves, I would definitely recommend for a patient to practice um, retrieving their assisted device so that if they're walking and it falls down, that they're not just stuck. Now, typically it doesn't happen with a walker. So I wouldn't necessarily worry about it with somebody who has a walker, but if they have a cane, a straight point cane or a crutch or something, I would teach that, especially if it's somebody who's already stable and doesn't have balance issues. All right, tilt table. Um, we're just going to kind of mention, uh, so why we would use a tilt table. It can help somebody get used to gravity. So if they um, have been in bed, like let's say maybe they were in a coma or they were in the ICU for a long time or something like that, and they are, you know, very deconditioned or not used to sitting up, then when they start to sit up, their body's not used to it. Their blood pressure will drop. That's that orthostatic hypotension. And they may go into their uh, vitals, may go crazy because it's not used to that. So getting them more and more used to an upright position is key. Um, so a tilt table is a great way to do that if the facility has it. So you see them more in like an acute care setting than anywhere. Um, it can help you facilitate weight bearing. Um, so if there's weight bearing precautions, then you probably don't want to use tilt table unless you do something where you stack up something on the good leg so that they're standing on the good leg like a, a step or something without the other leg touching. You may be able to do that. Um, a tilt table, remember weight bearing allows us to uh, increase the oxygen or the um, calcium reuptake and so it helps strengthen our bones keep us from developing osteoporosis weakening of the bones because we've not put any pressure on them and so the calcium is just getting excreted from our system rather than reabsorbed so it can help that um, it can help uh, decrease your orthostatic hypotension allow you to get 
used to that upright position so your blood pressure doesn't drop as much. It improves pulmonary ventilation. Remember when you're laying down, the fluid is all across the back of your lungs, all the way up towards the top of your lungs. And typically when you're upright, the very the top part of your lungs just has air in it. It's not supposed to have fluid. So the longer you're in that position where a dependent position where the fluid is resting throughout the back of your lung, the more likely you are to develop pneumonia. So it is key in helping avoid things like that. And then, of course, uh, just being in that position alone can help increase arousal and awareness. Now, it's not something that we put somebody in the tilt table and leave and come back two hours later. You know, it's a short-term treatment that we're standing there for. <laughs> um, and so um, it can help so if somebody is you know, recently out of a coma, but they're ready for that type of therapy, it can help um, keep them from, you know, maybe they're falling asleep often throughout treatment. It can increase that, uh, that awareness. So contraindications. Um, if both of their legs they cannot weight bear on, well, there's no way that they could do a tilt table. If they have an unstable spinal cord injury, then we don't want to do anything <laughs> to move them, really. We want to just only uh, do what the doctor is indicating for them to uh, be done because that basically means the wrong movement and uh, they're paralyzed. So we don't, if the uh, spinal column is unstable and uh, they have a spinal cord injury and they've not underwent the surgery or whatnot to fix that, we do not do any type of weight bearing or, or movement into that position. You can look at page 283 of your mobility and context book to look at the proper setup. And uh, before you do it, tell the patient what you're doing and why and what to expect. It can be, actually be really scary. Um, even I remember practicing in lab, even when I was like um, not real close to upright, maybe 15 to 30 degrees from being upright, I felt like I was falling forward. I mean, I felt like I was going to just fall straight on my face. It It can be, it can make you feel very, uh, out of control because you're not controlling the movement at all and be um, kind of hard to, to take that position. So um, this is the end of the lecture and I hope that you have gotten a lot out of it. Of course, you can text or email me any questions that you have and um, just let me know uh, if you need any help with this information.